We've got more in store for you because we're going to start a new book. Yes. It doesn't happen very often at Faith Bible Church that we start a new book. We're going to study the book of Samuel. Which one, Pastor Rob? There are two. Yes, in our English text, there is 1st and 2nd Samuel, but in the original Hebrew Bible, there's just Samuel. I'll let you know if we're going to do both or not in a couple years. But before we dive into the text, let's understand the date and the setting of the book in its historical context. It's important to interpret Scripture in the historical context in which it was written. What goes on in a person's world affects their language and it affects their experience, does it not? Ten years ago, if I used the term like iPad or fiscal cliff, nobody would know what I'm talking about. But now here in 2013, you can't go a day without hearing somebody talk about their iPads or their fiscal cliffs. Same is true in Samuel. In order to know what's going on, we need to be familiar with their age. Pastor Bob last week gave us a great summary of the life of Abraham, the faith father of all who believe. Both Jews and Christians can trace their faith back to Abraham. God said in Genesis 22, 17, he said to Abraham, Blessings, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore. Abraham has two kinds of descendants. He has earthly descendants, the nation of Israel, which is represented by the sand of the sea, but he also has spiritual descendants, the church, those who, like Abraham, come to God simply by faith, and they are represented as the stars of the heaven, not earthly descendants, but spiritual, heavenly descendants. Now, God made an unconditional covenant, a promise to Abraham. We see in Scripture, God makes two types of covenants. He makes unconditional covenants, and he makes conditional covenants. Conditional covenants use the if-then formula. Classic example of that would be 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. It says, if my people who are called by name shall humble themselves, pray, seek their face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. If you do this, then I will do that. The then is not guaranteed in a conditional covenant. It's based on the conditions that people uphold their end of the bargain. We have to do our part. Let me challenge you with a New Year's resolution. In 2013, determine to think biblically. Determine to think biblically. People will ask a lot of complicated questions that they think there's no answer for. But if they knew their Bibles and they thought biblically, they could understand the hows and the whys of the world around them, and they would be able to clearly see what they ought to be doing. For example, people will ignorantly say, if God is so good, why would a good God allow these disasters to strike and all this pain and destruction to take place around the world? They will assume because disasters are bad, a good God has failed or he simply doesn't exist. However, that is an incomplete theory. Some factors have been left out of that equation. Sin, for one, has not been factored into that equation, nor has the working and schemes of the devil been factored into that equation, nor has the revealed word of God, or quite specifically the conditional covenants been factored into that equation, nor has their own activities been factored into that equation. In order to know God and what he is doing and why, in order to know what he blesses and why, in order to know how God can bless you, you need to think biblically, you need to know and do the word of God, you need to walk in obedience. There are many conditional covenants Promises in the Bible that God has made, some are for individuals, some are for leaders of homes, some are for leaders of churches, some are for leaders of people's groups or nations. If we know these covenants, these promises, and we do them, God, too, will honor them. So that's conditional covenants, but he also makes 
unconditional covenants. Unconditional covenants. What's that? Well, God said something, and he's going to do it, and it doesn't matter what the person does or doesn't do. God is going to follow through. Abraham and the children of Israel had an unconditional covenant. Pastor Bob touched on it last week, so let's uh, fill it out a little bit more. Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household. Go to a land I'll show you. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You will be a blessing. I'll bless those that bless you. Whoever curses you, I'll curse. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. Adding to that is uh, the promise of the land. In Genesis 15, 18 to 21, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, your descendants, to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. And then we already did Genesis 22 a moment ago. So God's unconditional covenant to Abraham is threefold. It includes three aspects. There's land, there's seed, and then there is blessing. This covenant has not yet been completely fulfilled. I would say that the seed part has been fulfilled, the Genesis 22, 17, about the descendants of Abraham being a vast number. As we already talked about physically and spiritually, Abraham has tons of descendants. Certainly, Abraham's name has been made great, and uh, everyone in the world, well, most people know uh, something of Abraham, and all of the world has been blessed through the line of Abraham because our Savior who is Christ the Lord, comes through the line of Abraham. But let's look specifically at the promise of land. I want to show you a map, and uh, re reviewing what that passage we just read, God promised to Abraham, all the land from the river in Egypt, which would be the Nile, to the great river Euphrates, all of this was the promised land that God said he was going to give to Abraham. I got it yet? Did they ever get it? No. They got this little piece right here. And then you notice the various nations that are on there, and you realize, well, this is going to be a bloodbath <laughs> to get all of this land from that, wouldn't it? It's going to be a long, hard battle. So that communicates you, that communicates to us a couple of different things. It communicates that either God lied to Abraham or he just isn't strong enough to keep his word, or he's not finished yet. He's not done with Israel. The fact that there is always nonstop conflict in tension in this part of the world lends me to believe that our adversary, the devil, Satan, works very hard to keep this physical piece of real estate under his control because he's desperately trying to prevent God's word from coming true. The devil wants to prove God to be a liar, for if God can't keep his word, then he can't be God. And everything that God has promised to do is something that Satan tries to stop. That's why he's called the adversary, right? And you know that to be true in your own life. The things that God has promised to bless, the things that are God has you've made vows before, are the things that get attacked, like your marriage and all of these things that God likes to uh, to promise and to bless. He, you know, the devil thought he had the nation dismantled for 1878 years. Israel did not exist on the map, but boom, it's sprung back up in 1948 because God is not done. His word does not return void. When God makes a promise. An unconditional covenant, he intends to keep it. So Abraham lived around 2000 B.C. According to the book of Genesis, he was called by God, and we talked about this last week, Pastor Bob, to leave his homeland, to go live in a place that God would show him, and Abram lived as a nomad in, oh, go back one more time for me. Yeah, one more. In this area here called the Fertile Crescent. Abraham was referred to in Genesis 14, 13 as Abram the Hebrew. It is interesting to note in the ancient Sumerian, Egyptian, Akkadian, Hittite, Mitanni, and Ugaric sources, if you're into that kind of stuff, all of those places and all those sources, 
They date roughly between 1800 and 1100 B.C. They all talk about a group of people as living as nomadic invaders in the area of the Fertile Crescent, and they refer to these people as the Habiru. The Habiru. In English, we pronounce that Hebrew. The Hebrew. Extra-biblical sources which date the Habiru's existence in the land of Canaan and Egypt agree with our Old Testament scripture. Oh, and here's a picture of an Egyptian carving of a Habiru prisoner which was found in the tombs of Armana in Egypt. A little piece of physical evidence for you. Most modern liberal scholars will reject the notion that the Habiru spoken of in all those ancient sources I was telling you about refer to the Hebrew that are found in the Bible because that does not fit their liberal theory that the Bible is historically inaccurate. They believe the Bible is historically inaccurate. But as John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. And whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, the dictates of our passions, they can't alter the states of facts and evidence. People, listen to me. I'm not a scholar. Not a deep intellect. You know that. I believe the Bible was the word of God and thus true long before I could question or rationalize. But now that I'm 42 years old and I can read and rationalize, I can uh, compare and contrast, I can search and study, I can deduce and decide, and I can tell you there is physical, historical, archaeological evidence that proves the Bible is telling the truth. All the modern scholars can do with the evidence carved in stone is try to spin it. But facts are stubborn things. And if you go looking for them, you will find them. Fact, Abram was a real guy called a Hebrew. He had a son in his old age, Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had how many sons? Twelve sons. They moved down to Egypt where for a time they prospered and grew into the 12 tribes, which made up the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel intimidated the Egyptians, so the, the Egyptians enslaved the Hebrews, and for 400 years they suffered, but Moses led them out of Egypt and to the Promised Land. Moses gave them the law and wrote the first five books of the Bible. However, due to the nation's fear and disobedience, they were not allowed to enter the Promised Land, they had to stay in the wilderness for 40 years, for 40 years until the unbelieving generation died off. There's a whole sermon right in that alone. Then Joshua was raised up and led them across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land in 1400 B.C. The book of Joshua tells all about the conquest. The people succeeded in establishing themselves in the land, dividing the land amongst the various tribes, settling down to build their homes and build their communities. But failure to completely drive out the inhabitants of the land and failure to obey the laws of God brought times of punishment and occupation from foreign nations. Look at Judges chapter 3 with me for a moment. I want to show you the cycle that takes place in the book of Judges. Every story in Judges begins with spiritual decline. In Judges chapter 3, we'll just look at a couple of brief examples. In verse number 7, what does it say? The Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, served Baals and Ashtaroth. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, so he sold them into the hand of that big long name. Look at verse number 12. Once again, the, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord because they did evil in the sight of the Lord. God gave, egg, gave them to Eglon, king of Moab. Go over to chapter 4. After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So God gave them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan. Every story in Judges begins with Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. If rebellion brought defeat, then repentance would bring victory. And when the nation would repent, and call out to God for help, he would raise up a judge to deliver the people 
and restore the peace and the blessing into their lives. And the book of Judges records this time in the nation of Israel's history. So, for all you people who complain how long I take to do a book, look how much history I have done in 15 minutes. That's pretty good. Getting us right up to this place, Samuel is the last of the judges. He is the last of the judges, and uh, Samuel is very interesting because he holds three roles. He was a priest in the nation of Israel, and he also heard from the Lord directly, so that made him a, a prophet. Just because you were a priest didn't mean you heard from God directly. Oftentimes, prophets were separate from priests, but he was prophet and priest, and because he was an appointed judge, not an anointed king, but an appointed judge, he held that position as a leader, as a judge. So he was prophet, priest, and judge, and nobody had ever done that before. But it does tell us in Scripture that one day when the Messiah, Jesus Christ, returns, he is going to hold all three roles of prophet and priest and king of kings and lord of lords. We'll learn more about that once we get into the text. But that's a little bit of background to help us understand how this book fits and where exactly it fits in the history and the timeline of the nation Israel. We're at about 1100 B.C., okay? That's where we are with Samuel, 1100 B.C. But look at the last verse of Judges, Judges chapter 125, because this best summarizes the spiritual, political, moral, philosophical state of the nation, of people. This is how they thought. It says in Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Whenever people do what is right in their own eyes, you end up with a very mixed bag. Some people's right in their own eyes is right. The folks who tried to follow the laws of Moses and worship God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were doing right. Other people's right in their own eyes is wrong. People who ignored the laws and served other gods and served their own self-interest, they were doing wrong. And I think that that parallels our day and age, does it not? We, too, live in a time when people do what seems right in their own eyes. And some people's right is right. Right? Am I right? And other people's right is wrong. Not left, but wrong. Let's get political here. The folks who tried to uh, follow what was right were doing all right, but lots of people were doing it wrong. And all sides were having an impact on the culture and on society. We know that there are promises and blessings that God would pour out on our entire nation if people were more specifically, more specifically, if our leaders would honor and obey the Lord and would do right. But because they do not, God withholds these blessings from the nation. However, that doesn't mean that God has abandoned the individual who will do right. The restoration of the nation always starts with the faith in the obedience of the individual. Write that down. We're going to see that in 1 Samuel. The restoration of the nation always starts with the faith and the obedience of the individual. How do we bring blessing and God's hand of protection back to our land? How do we see revival and restoration of truth and morality in our society? It starts with the individual. You have to live by faith. You have to walk in obedience. Listen to me now. God is looking. The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro across the earth. He's looking and he's listening for those who will show, he will show himself strong for those who are loyal to him. God will show himself strong on behalf of those who are loyal to him. The problem for many of us is we don't want God to see what we're doing. We don't want God to hear us and what we're saying. So we're not crying out. We're not asking God to speak. Therefore, he doesn't speak. Because if we would do what's right, if we would be faithful, would he see us? Would he hear us? 
my notes, verse 10, chapter 1. I have verses 1 through 11 in the, in the bulletin, but let's do the first two verses. There was a certain man, Herathaim, a Zephite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoam, the son of Elihud, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, hmm. one called Hannah and the other called Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Okay, so we're meeting the people. Elkanah the Ephraimite. Generally in the Old Testament, when the text introduces you to someone new, they list their fathers and the tribe that they were from. Often we gloss over these names because it is hard for Pastor Rob to enunciate them but also because there's not a whole lot said about these people, so there's not a whole lot to say. But the point of the genealogy is always to hook this individual back to their specific tribal families, which, of course, connects them back to the patriarchs, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which means what? It ultimately connects them back to the covenant, right? These are people who are in a covenant relationship. Elkanah is in a covenant relationship with God. That's why you have to know, have to know the background. We have to understand these people and their actions in relation to the revelations that they have received from God. Furthermore, there were various blessings or prophecies that were spoken over specific tribes. Ephraim technically was not a son of Israel. You know that? Right? He was the son of who? Some of you know. Joseph, right? Joseph had two sons, Manasseh the older and Ephraim the younger, that Israel wanted to adopt. He wanted to do that because he wanted to give Joseph a double portion of the blessings of God and the promised land. So he took these two boys of, of Joseph's and said, I'm going to take both these guys. They're going to be mine, and they're going to, that way your name and your, your line is going to get more. Now, when he took these boys in, he blessed them, but he gave the firstborn blessing to Ephraim, the younger. He preferred Ephraim over his older brother, which was kind of apropos because that's exactly what happened with, with, uh, with Israel. Remember, he was the younger, but he got the blessing over the older. But he blessed this tribe specifically, and he said that they were going to be, Ephraim was going to be a nation of many people a tribe that was going to have a group of many nations come out of this. Uh, two of the greatest leaders in Israel came from the tribe of Ephraim. Joshua was an Ephraimite, and of course, who is an Ephraimite? Samuel is an Ephraimite. That's right. Um, uh, also, a uh, prior to the temple being built in Jerusalem, in Elkanah's day, the tabernacle was where they worshipped, and that was in Shiloh. Shiloh was in Ephraimite territory. So the tribe of Ephraim is the center of the spiritual religious center of the nation. One other interesting Ephraimite was Jeroboam was an Ephraimite. And you remember that Jeroboam was the king of the ten northern tribes when the nation of Israel split in two. He's not necessarily a hero, but it is still illustrating just how influential and how strong leaders were coming out of this Ephraimite line that Israel had prophesied over. And as you go through uh, Scripture and you read about the, the different prophets, and they refer to the ten northern tribes, the, 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 king, the northern kingdom, often they'll just call them Ephraim, meaning the whole lot. Just like in the, uh, they'll, they'll talk about the southern two tribes, they'll call it Judah. Even though there's two tribes there, they just the strongest tribe is the one that gets named, okay? So Elkanah, he's an Ephraimite. His main name means God has ordained, and he has two wives. Now, at this point, the 800-pound gorilla sitting in our text is polygamy, right? Polygamy. How can God be working through these people who are involved in polygamy? Or, one might conclude, why do you say polygamy is wrong? After all, it's 
in the Bible. Or somebody might say, you know, it seems like God's changing his mind because he was all for polygamy in the Old Testament, but now in the New Testament, he's against it. Sounds like God's, you know, fluid. Aren't you glad you come to a church where we tackle really interesting stuff? Don't just gloss over these things. Okay. First of all, when it comes to interpreting Scripture and coming up with applications, you must pay attention to the genre of literature that you're reading. All right? When we were finishing up 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians was a letter written with the express purpose of telling you precisely what God wants. That's called didactic literature, giving you dictates, right? Do this, do that. Samuel is what kind of literature? Historical. Uh, another genre we would class it under is narrative, okay? It's narrative. It tells a story, an account of what God did and what God said. In pulling applications out of narrative passages, you have to remember the principle of progressive revelation. Progressive revelation. God was revealing his will to humanity progressively over the entire period that the Bible was written. It wasn't completed in 1100 B.C. His revelation wasn't completed in 1100 B.C. It is now in 2013 A.D. But in 1100 B.C., God hadn't specifically said, be married to only one person. Mind you, he hadn't said you can or you should marry more than one person. It's just that he hasn't said you should not. While we observe this passage, uh, what we do observe in this passage is a couple of examples of reasons why you shouldn't marry more than one person. As we get into the story here, you see that the ladies weren't really getting along. They didn't really like the setup. They were fighting with each other. It wasn't really a happy home. But as of yet, it has not been officially stated in God's revealed word that they can't be married to more than one person. So technically, Elkanah has not broken any express commands of God. But as time goes on, God gives more revelation. In later books of the Old Testament, we see more examples and narrative passages of multiple wives being a problem for, I can't imagine, man, I can't imagine multiple wives being a problem for any guy. I don't get an amen from you guys. You're all chicken on that one. Okay, I'll get an amen. Okay, very good. Very wise. Uh, it, it, it didn't work for David very well, did it? Didn't work. Who else the other guy really didn't work for? That's right, Solomon. That didn't go so well. Jesus tightens the whole marriage relationship up, and he says this is for two people, husband and wife, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. Jesus says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. The union is between a man and his wife. The two become one, and they are not to be separated. We have here God's ideal plan for marriage, clearly stated, clearly commanded. Anyone claiming to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, needs to understand that Jesus, God in the flesh, said that a man is to be joined to his wife. That is God's word of what marriage consists of. Paul reinforces this to the believers in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He teaches that the elder is to be the husband of one wife. For the Gentile nations who were receiving that revelation of God for the first time, that was new because various cultures were allowed to have more than one. But here is this new, complete revelation of God that it needs to be one man and one woman. I never thought in my lifetime in ministry I would need to clearly stress that a marriage is between a man and a woman. But apparently it is not understood by many people in our society. Our new law, which allows people to, of the same sex to marry one another, is opposite of what the Bible clearly teaches. The law is disobedience to what God has clearly revealed to us, and consequently, it is a sinful law that this church cannot adhere to. 
And as long as I am the pastor of Faith Bible Church, we will not adhere to it. And I will teach and preach against it. And if you do not believe that, and you do not wish to be affiliated with the church that is going to reject the law of the land, and you do not believe the word of God, then I just recommend you go find another church. There are plenty of apostate churches out there who do not believe the Bible is the word of God. You will fit right in. I'm sure you can find one. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I'm a perfect person who never disobeys God. Nobody in this church ever disobeys God. Trust me, I sin, I disobey, so do you all. But what we don't do is we don't say our sin is perfectly okay. My disobedience is right, and God's word is a mistake. When we sin, we humble ourselves. We come to God and we repent of our sin. So I'm not saying you shouldn't come to this church if you sin. What I'm saying is if you want to call your sin right and God wrong, this isn't the place for you. See, just like in Samuel's time, so is our day. People do what seems right in their own eyes. But that's not us. We don't want to live our own way. We want to live according to God's word. It's authoritative for our lives. We need to pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will help us to live for him and like him in 2013. That's as far as I can go in Samuel, folks. We'll get into a whole lot more next week. Brother Nevola, would you please come up?